welcome everybody as far as i can see it's right on the hour so it's time to get going welcome along thank you for coming along to another office hours it is freezing cold here in perth and i've just got back from apex connect so i've got a head cold so uh there'll be use of these throughout throughout the uh, session so uh all i can say is uh, virtual ears and eyes at various points when i below my nose. As I say at the start of most office hours, getting in touch with me is very easy. I set up a thing called Linktree slash Connor, easy to remember, easy to type in, and it simply takes you to a list of all the ways you can get in touch with me, whether it's my blog, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, rather than inundate you with a million links, that's one easy link, and you can always get in touch with me. I thoroughly enjoy talking technology. So if these office hour sessions aren't a good time for you, or we didn't get to your question, or you have follow-up stuff, please re reach out to me. I'm always happy to talk tech, uh, unless I'm on a plane, etc. So let's talk about some things. As I always say also, noted to adjust your set, the slides are always tilted to the bottom left, as you can see like that one there. That's because, as you're probably aware, if you've been on Office Hours before, but if you're new, what we do is we record these and we turn them into YouTube videos and my ugly, cold-ridden, snuffly face will be plonked at the top right and the notes we put at the bottom left. So before we get into the questions, I normally start with some bits and pieces. Let's talk about some stuff that's happening or is coming up. The first one was Apex Connect. If you joined the call before 8pm, you would have seen just a few picture highlights there. I've just come back from the Apex Connect conference in Germany, in Bonn. It's Pitched as an Apex conference, and most of the content is Apex, but it's growing. It's talking all the components of Apex that make you into a great full stack Apex developer. So we had sessions on SQL, PL SQL, as well as Apex, and including JavaScript. Dan McGann did a keynote on the third day. The reason I thought I'd touch on it was we had a dedicated stream this year on beginner level tracks. If you're getting into SQL, getting into PL SQL, and I thought that was a really cool initiative. They did it last year as well, uh, just on Apex. They've extended it this year to be more of the uh, stack. The reason I'd recommend it for your own user group meetings or your own even office meetings, I'm um, not office hours, just your own office at work, is one of the benefits of doing it this way is I met a lot of people who would probably be described as uh, perhaps introverted or a bit shy about coming up and speaking to people at conferences, not just the speakers, but also just intermingling with people. If it's your first conference or you're fairly new to the technology, it can be a little bit intimidating. By having the beginner's track, people feel a lot more comfortable. I had a lot more interaction with attendees and other speakers, and I thought it went really, really well. So even though if you're on the call and you're an experienced Oracle professional and the inclination is to keep talking on more and more complicated and exciting topics, sometimes I think it's worthwhile remembering that, you know, if you consider an average level of skill in Oracle, uh, Oracle technology, then obviously the definition of average means 50% of people are below that level of skill because they're new to the technology. So it's good to actually pitch your mindset at that level to make sure you uh, are inclusive of everyone involved in technology. That way we can build a bigger community. Coming up, the Yatra tour. I mentioned this last night. The call for papers has finished, but I spoke to Sai. He's always keen to have more people either attending or speaking at the Yatra tour. As you can see there, it is a stack of cities in India. I'm hoping to get to uh, at least half of them, hopefully more. Uh, for me, it falls in the middle of my school holidays for the children, so I have to organize that, but Yatra's coming up. If you are interested in either attending or speaking at it, please email Sai, put his email address there. Um, funny enough, I'll hold this up. I actually had Indian tonight. Uh, that's lamb sarg, uh, beautiful, fantastic meal. So I'm prepping myself, prepping myself for the fantastic Indian food as it comes up. And last bit of promotion before we get stuck into it, Kscope. Kscope is coming up in, I think, just five weeks. It's um, toward the end of June. This year, we've got something new and exciting. The event itself runs Monday to Thursday, I think, as it normally does. But rather than just say, well, there's your huge big conference that you have to, A, spend a whole lot of money on and also commit to, there's a lot of people, especially if you live in the US, that really can only afford one day of their time. So what we're doing is before the conference starts, 
is having a thing called the Sunday Symposium. And effectively, it's like an Oracle training day. We're pitching it once again at that sort of new to average level into our level of skill, not at the high end expertise end. And we're doing things on how SQL's processed, understanding PL SQL, and understanding the optimizer and explain plans. And hopefully you're impressed by the lineup there. We've got Maria Colgan, myself, Stephen Blaine, Jeff Smith, Gerald Vensel. That whole thing is just a one day full event. We're giving away some prizes as well, but it's effectively like a one day heavy duty training seminar on Oracle. Now, if you Google for what that would normally cost anywhere else, I think you'll find, I can't remember what the actual cost of that is, but it's a pittance compared to what you'd normally spend on Oracle training. So that's my little pitch, my little sales pitch there, but uh, there's a simple link to follow. Hopefully, if you're coming to K-Scope, come along on the Sunday, we'll have a tremendous amount of education, but also a lot of fun as well. Um, I'll be running a little uh, quiz show there with some prizes and the like. Big announcement, big announcement from last time we spoke in Office Hours a month ago, Oracle 19 database came along for on-premise. You can now download the software and actually run it on your own system. So uh, if you're running Linux, which I'd imagine the vast majority of people are, uh, you can now download 19C and run it yourself. We'll actually do a bit of 19C stuff tonight uh, that came in on questions. And also you'd expect the Windows and other ports to come out very, very soon. In fact, I haven't checked recently, maybe the Solaris one is already out there, but certainly uh, all the other ports are coming shortly, but 19C for Linux came out, I think about two weeks ago. So uh, if you're keen on looking at new features, 19C is available there for you. And also uh, if you're interested in support levels, 19C is what we call the long-term release. It's gonna be the one that has the longest period of support. So if you've been deferring jumping from 11 or say 12.1, 19C is certainly the place to jump to. Let's look at the questions we've received. Global temporary tables and stats, 19C cloud and on-premise real-time stats, importing with eight data, try 12C and raw devices, mem optimize read and write, that's a 19C thing. Best effort standby on 19C, cross product certification, auto indexing, excessive sorting, random unique numbers. You know that thing when I said, please send us your questions? Yeah, maybe you guys got carried away. <laughs> so. I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm very pleased to have the popularity of DBA office hours grow such that people are happily sending in their questions. Will we cover, what's that, 11 topics tonight? You know, given my track record, it's unlikely, um, extremely likely, but we'll start at the top. I generally treat them in uh, the order they come in and also in terms of what I think is the biggest benefit for the uh, attendees. But we'll, we'll go through them. Anything we don't cover, I'll simply put on a list for next month's office hours. So hopefully everyone's okay with that. So let's start with GTC Global. I won't even say try to say GTT because I'll keep stuffing that up. Let's start with Global Temporary Table Statistics. And the question was, in fact, it was actually a statement. Someone said, I think there's a bug in Global Temporary Table Statistics from 12C or 12.2 onwards. Sometimes doing a gather of statistics will do a commit and sometimes it won't. And that's something that we've never seen before. Is that a bug? To help explain what this potential bug is, I think we need to first cover what the actual changes were for global temporary table statistics in 12C. And rather than bore you to death with slides, <laughs> that'll come later in the hour, uh, let's do some demos. So let's go up a new share. First, I'm gonna show you the standard 11G behavior. Now, don't be confused by the title, which says I'm connected to a database 18. What I've done here is I've set some uh, parameters such that this will act like an 11G database. So I've created a global temporary table called T, an on commit preserve rows. I'll insert 10,000 rows into it and gather stats. We can gather stats on just about anything and that's pretty cool, so far so good. Let's now do an explain plan on querying that table. I'm just doing a simple select star from T. And so far, this looks exactly as we'd like. I put 10,000 rows in, I gathered stats, 10,000 rows, and the optimizer thinks I'm going to get 10,000 rows, table access full 10,000. Everything there is just running sweet. Where the problems start is of course, this is a global temporary table. It is private, <laughs> that's why we call it global, not such a great word. It is private to the session. 
So if I reconnect, you can see the connected at the top there, I've reconnected in a brand new session. So of course, for this session, the global temporary table is empty. What happens if I put 50 rows in? As I said, this is a brand new session. I can do whatever I want. I've reconnected and therefore lost the previous session. But if that was a separate session that was open, it would still have its 10,000 rows sitting in there. This session only has 50. What happens though when I do a trace only explain? This session thinks I'm going to get 10,000 rows, even though there's only 50. The reason for this is in all versions of Oracle before 12, table stats were stats for the table. That seems like an obvious statement, but we only have one table. We only have one set of stats. So it applies to everybody. Doesn't matter how many people have a global temporary table, the last person to collect stats, their numbers are the ones that get used for everyone. Some mitigations for this in Oracle 11 would be don't collect stats ever on the table. What you could do is leave the stats blank and then dynamic sampling would kick in. Now that might sound like a perfect solution, but in reality, someone might dynamically sample a query, select star from T in one session. They might see their sample of say 50 rows as this session has got here. If another session also in quick succession does the same query, they won't necessarily dynamically sample. If they see an execution plan for that same SQL already in the library cache, they'll simply reuse it to avoid the parsing overhead. So dynamic sampling helps you a little bit, but the reality is people are still gonna pick up stats for global temporary table data that actually is from someone else's session. That's not such a good thing. So let's now look at the 12C behavior. Now, as you can see, I've called a thing called set global preps under DBMS stats to say that global temp table stats are now at session level. Now, this is something you won't have to do. This is the default in 12C. As the name sort of suggests, and we'll run through the demo, you can see hopefully what's gonna improve things here. I'm gonna create my global temporary table again. I'm gonna insert 10,000 rows into this session and gather stats. Now, when I do set auto trace plan, I get 10,000 rows as the estimate. No difference there. One subtle difference is you can see it says global temporary session private statistics used. That sounds promising. Let me reconnect. I'll continue the same demo as we did before. I'm reconnected, brand new session. The table is empty. I'll put in just 50 rows. Recall in 11G, you would actually get an estimate of 10,000. I'll gather stats in this session. And look at this, fantastic. Now I get a session figure of 50. I'm using session private stats. This is one of the very cool things in Oracle 12, in the sense that we now have a set of statistics for each session in the global temporary table, as opposed to globally for all sessions, which by definition is probably gonna be wrong unless you've got one of those very lucky applications that has the same number of data no matter what session you're running in your global temporary table. So that's the changes in 12C. As I mentioned, it's important to realize that if you upgrade to Oracle 12, that new private session level of statistics is the default setting. Normally when we introduce new features in the database, they default to the backward compatibility version. Sorry, let me try that again in English. Normally when we upgrade a database, we generally err on the side of backward compatibility. We generally don't introduce new features without you actually having a flag to turn them on. The reason we opted for the new feature by default in 12C is, in reality, I really can't see much benefit of the old 11G version. It's what we were stuck with 11G, but I don't think it was ever really gonna be a good option. So in this case, we've actually chosen the new option to be the default. But there is a dilemma. And this is actually, now that we've covered understanding of what the new session private stats are, global temporary tables can be phrased in two different ways. And before I cover that, it's important to realize that that will be impacted by the fact that DBMS stats does a commit. All calls to DBMS stats do a commit before they start. Now that might have some implications when it comes to global temporary tables. Let's continue our demo. I'm gonna create my global temporary table. And the keyword here is, and I've used this for all the previous demos, I've done on commit preserve rows. And this is what I do when I want to have a global temporary table that I'm gonna do multiple operations on. So I want to be able to end a transaction and not lose the rows. I'll put one row in and gather stats. Now, because DBMS stats gather table stats does a commit, 
I can see if I, even if I issue a rollback at that point in time, my row is still in there. Even though I never explicitly issued a commit, DBMS stats has actually done a commit and therefore my row is persisted. That creates a bit of a drama because there's another form of global temporary table, which you can see there on line two is on commit delete rows. And that's a type of global temporary table where the moment I end a transaction, either with a commit or a rollback, the data simply ceases to exist. So I put my row in there. Now, in previous releases, I generally wasn't gonna collect stats on the global temporary table anyway, because it generally was gonna give me bad performance. But having just spent five minutes telling you, woohoo, look, global temporary table stats, session private stats, aren't these fantastic? I'd like to call DBMS stats here. But what's DBMS stats gonna do? It's gonna do a commit. And what's that commit gonna do? Well, my rows are gonna disappear. So the stats are gonna come out as zero in all cases. That is a bit of a problem. Now, much as you may <laughs> claim otherwise, we're not stupid here at Oracle. We realize that this is a drama. So what do we do? Well, let's gather table stats and see what happens. The row is there. Now, even that is perhaps something that might be alarming or hopefully a pleasant surprise to you because this is a on commit delete rows. If DBMS gather table stats does a commit, surely that row should have disappeared. And in fact, if I do a rollback, the data is gone. What we've done in 12.2 and above is DBMS stats can now optionally commit. It's not something in your control. That might be something that comes in future, but at the moment, it's not something that's under your control. When we have a global temporary table and we see that its definition is on commit delete rows, we know that A, yes, you'd like to collect stats on it because the new session private stats are pretty cool. But B, we realize if you were to do so with the old behavior of DMS stats, then you'd be shooting yourself in the foot. The data would be gone. So we modified DMS stats to not do a commit. When I was investigating this, I actually had someone probe around in the actual source code for DBMS stats for me. And I actually found this, there's actually a procedure in there called effectively, am I allowed to do a commit at this point in time? And this is the comment It actually says, this procedure decides whether the target table is an on commit delete rows GTT. I said, I wasn't gonna say that, with session private stats. If yes, we do not commit, otherwise we do commit. So we have, Session private stats turned on, which is the default in 12. If you turn that off, we will do a commit. And it's a global temporary table with on commit delete rows. We are offering that ability to collect stats without interrupting your transaction flow. That's pretty cool. The question is why? Why did we go to this effort? Why did we only allow the non commit at this point, but everywhere else we commit? Well, I've mentioned before about backward compatibility. One of the things that a lot of people might be relying on in their application code is that I can do all sorts of stuff and if I call DBMS stats, that's gonna commit my transaction. We wanted to preserve that intent because we'd hate to actually break someone's application by saying, you know what, DBMS stats doesn't commit anymore, but we didn't tell you. So it's only in that particular case we've done it. The reason we felt confident about doing it in that particular case is I can be pretty confident that no one currently is calling DBMS stats after populating a global temporary table with on commit delete rows because to do so is to empty that data straight out. So anyone that's doing that already is currently effectively have, has a code bug because they're wiping their data. So this is the only time that we can feel confident and say, yep, if we do this, we're not interrupting anyone's existing code and we're giving added value by actually be having you genuine private stats even for your on commit delete rows. So it's pretty cool. And that's why DBMS stats now is not 100% guaranteed to do a commit. It will in almost all cases, except for private stats, global temporary table, on commit delete rows. So hopefully that answers that question. As I look at the time, 11 topics isn't looking promising, but not to worry. This next one is not really a question. This is just someone that decided to jump onto my office hours question entry screen uh, sometime during the month and share some thoughts with me about 19C cloud and on-premise. I'll paraphrase, but this is effectively what the uh, sentence went. It was actually a few paragraphs, but 
It was cloud, 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 cloud. You guys don't care about existing customers anymore who uh, might be on premise. And there were some, a few choice words, a few choice expletives. I had a bit of a chuckle about it. Thankfully, I'm from Australia, so I've got nice thick skin. But I thought I'd address it here because uh, no one has to admit it on the call, but I'd be willing to bet that a few people may be thinking have similar sentiments. Uh, obviously, if you've been to any Oracle events of late, obviously we push the cloud metaphor and the cloud process fairly hard. And it's funny how people think, well, if I'm pushing A, that means I'm forgetting about B. You know, if I'm pushing cloud, I don't care about um, on-premise. I'm here to try and convince you uh, that that's not the case. That's certainly from a personal point of view. And I think from my team point of view and the database division where I work point of view, uh, do I speak for the entire Oracle Corporation? Uh, no, I'm, that's above my pay grade. But certainly uh, from my perspective and the circles I walk in inside the company, uh, that is not the case. So let's talk about a couple of the questions that have motivated this sentiment uh, of people in the community. One is why do you release on cloud and Exadata first? Well, I wanna stress that this isn't some sort of secret ploy to, to snaffle people getting onto the cloud. Yes, we would do release on cloud and Exadata first, but one thing that people don't seem to realize is, is this is actually done for reasons, hopefully to help all customers, including on-premise customers. And I can understand where the resentment comes from because here's something I picked out of our, our blog post that back in February, we released 19C on cloud and Exadata. And everyone's going, but I'm not an Exadata, I'm not on cloud, where can I get my 19C? But we need to look at the details as well. And what I mean by that is, what came out in February, 19.2, 19.2 of the Oracle database, 19.1 never saw the light of day, 19.2 was our first major set of revision updates to 19, and that's the one that we went production with on Exadata. When on-premise came out just a few weeks ago, and you may have seen this in the opening slide, did we hang on to the on-premise version for you know, a couple of months and then go, yeah, let's just hold off, let's just hold off and, and make people sweat? No, we gave it the next version. It's not 19.2, it's 19.3. The reason we do this is if we only release on cloud and Exadata, that is a very, very narrow set of hardware, infrastructure, software, and platforms that we are releasing the product on. That is also the product that the version and platform that we build the Oracle database on. It is our best way of doing an incremental release to customers. And it's funny how people criticize us for this, but you look at any large vendor when they're releasing software to a global marketplace. Whether it's you know, people like Facebook, they do releases, changes to their website, they do them in a locality first, then a state, then a country, then the world. Instagram, all the big vendors do, they effectively do either A-B testing, if it's something not critical like a database, but if it is a serious product like a database, generally, if you can release it to a small group of very controlled, very consistent set of software platforms, we have the best chance of success for those customers, but we also learn the most about the product. Hopefully, if we released 19.2 and there was some showstopper bug and we released it globally on February to everyone, then what happens there is, A, a whole lot of people are impacted dramatically. And also, that's just hard to tackle from a support point of view. We have to then, you know, very, very rush out strong patches for everybody. I don't think it serves us and I don't think it serves you to actually do something like that. So it's not like we're just going, oh, cloud, 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 that way we can screw our on-premise customers. What we're doing here is doing effectively incremental releases, small release on the most stable platforms we know about and our greatest expertise is on. And then we go out after we've done more learning, more bug fixes, more patching, then we can roll up the next release, which is gonna be even more rock solid to the on-premise customers. So that's my view on thing. I actually think this is a smart thing. Don't get me wrong, I am just as frustrated because I obviously run 19 locally as well as on cloud when I'm just for my Ask Tom and, and play things and exploration. I would love to have 19 on my laptop when I'm traveling around and you know, so I wait for it just like you do. I get just as frustrated, but I understand the purpose here. Does this mean 19.3 is bug free? No, 
I'm not silly. And hopefully you're not viewing, you know, holding us to that kind of level as well. That I think is fiction. The reality is it's not possible to deliver bug-free software, but hopefully this gets us closer to that utopia. I'll give you a real life example. I was playing with that 19.3 just the other day and I could not get a materialized view rewrite to work. As it turned out, I had a table called Jewel in my own schema. I'd created it, actually I was just showing someone some old stuff that how we used to create our own versions of Jewel for performance reasons back in Oracle 8 and Oracle 7 and I just inadvertently left it around. Turns out that if you have an index organized table called Jewel in your own schema, then some kinds of join fast refresh materialized views can't be fast refreshed. Now, yes, that's probably a bug. Do I expect Oracle to have picked that up in their testing? You know, I think that's probably a, a tough ask. Um, so yeah, so as I said, by doing it on Exadata first, on Linux first, and having that incremental release to the global customer base, I think it's a good thing, even though it can be a bit frustrating. So. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. If you think I'm just giving you some marketing spiel, um, I, hope, I hope I'm trying to convince you that I don't work for sales, I don't work for marketing. I think this is actually intelligent. And then the second one came out, it's like, yeah, yeah, thanks a lot, Connor. But when I go look at the license guide, some of the features are only cloud. Therefore, that proves my assertion that you guys are trying to force us onto cloud. Now, before I continue, I should say, I've thrown this slide up many times when I do talks um, around the place in Oracle. I'm about to talk a little bit about licensing, but I need to stress that if we look at the organization chart in Oracle, we have the people that do licensing way up the top where that red bracket is. And you can see where I sit in the organization. I sit generally um, a little bit lower in the, uh, in the organization. Um, as, as Ludith has just put in the chat line, uh, normally, I put a bucket and a cabbage in those other two slots there because that's about the same level uh, that I sit at the organization. That's my level of authority, but um, I didn't put it in this one. But as you can see, I really can't speak for the company in terms of licensing. It's above my pay grade. But I will say this on licensing. People say we only release stuff on cloud. When you say that precision is important, and what I mean by that is, let's go back to 2010. That's nearly a decade ago. Exadata's best kept secret. This isn't an Oracle blog. This is a blog by a third party, by uh, Mark Fielding, a good mate. He's from Pythian. On storage indexes, it's a particular optimization that only exists on Exadata. And if you've got an Exadata and you've ever looked at an execution plan on Exadata, even without storage indexes, we have this thing called table access storage full. That's another piece of secret source inside Exadata, which lets you do storage level application of predicates um, as opposed to in the compute layer. So the database load is lessened because the actual disk farm itself, the storage cells, can actually apply things like predicates and you know, simple operations before the data gets returned to the database. So ever since Exadata has been out, we have always had particular software parts of the database that are only available on Exadata. That isn't something new. That's been around forever since Exadata has been around. Now, I took just a subset of the licensing guide and I need to put this in a new share. Now, we don't need to drill too much into the detail here. I don't need to read this whole thing. All I've done is highlight the Exadata column in yellow. So this is straight out of the 19C documentation in terms of what you're allowed to run on the Oracle Exadata platform on premise. So people say to me, oh, you've got stuff that's only licensed on cloud. Well, I'm just gonna scroll down. Obviously it'll take maybe a while for your screen to catch up. But if you scroll down through here, you will not find a single no next to Exadata. All the Oracle 19C features that people claim are cloud only are sitting there and available for use on the Exadata platform on premise. And as I've just said, Exadata, we've always had that facility of certain things being available on Exadata that aren't available on standard enterprise edition. If you want to have a debate with me about whether you think that element is fair or unfair or not, fine, happy to have that debate with you maybe in another office hour session. 
But I just want to point out, people saying that we are only allowing stuff on cloud is not the case under 19C. Now, I will caveat that with one extra thing. I'll just go back to my slideshow. If we are doing things that are cloud only, it's generally only going to be in our autonomous database. And there's a reason for that, because autonomous is, by definition, a customer saying, I don't want to have to deal with any of this stuff. I want you to look after my system and not just look after I want you to deliberately improve my system as it's running. That's what an autonomous database does. So there will, I'm sure in future, be technologies that are only capable on the autonomous database and therefore only cloud because it only makes sense to have them on the autonomous database. If they were to be on a on-premise system, you'd probably be complaining about it or wondering, you know, how do I turn it off? Now, automatic indexing, for example, is one of those things that maybe sits that fine line, but it is available on Exadata. So, as I said, I want to stress here that from my perspective, from inside the company, taking the org chart in, in mind, is I don't see anything that says we are trying to force or deliberately frustrate customers to get them onto cloud. Or should say, we are enthusiastic about our cloud product, but also we are committed to supporting those customers that are currently running the database on premise, which is obviously the vast majority of you. Certainly that's my perspective. Um, and hopefully you observe that from the rest of the company. If not, please call us out on it. Um, our job is to obviously support all the customers inside the company, not just those that are on cloud. So uh, we're relying on you to um, hold us to account. Number three, real-time statistics. Can you show us an example of real-time statistics in 19C? And yes, I can. First, I'll do some background on 18C real-time statistics, which of course doesn't really exist, but this is more just to set the tone as to what real-time statistics are. Now, I should note that real-time statistics is an Exadata version only, and, and I'm not connected to an Exadata. I'm currently connected to a local database. And you're wondering, how do they do this? Just to full disclosure here, I reached out to one of the developers inside the actual database product group they gave me a butchered Oracle kernel to actually um, use. Now, when I say butchered, what it is is inside the database, we have to do obviously extensive testing of all the features. And we do that through all sorts of platforms and, and et cetera. As a result, we need a version of the kernel that actually operates every single feature, no matter what platform you're running it on. So I stress this is not a guaranteed 100% production version of the Oracle kernel. It's one that the developers have given me, which they use for their quality assurance testing. So be aware that if it doesn't work, uh, it's not 100% production, but it serves my purposes in order to demonstrate to you people uh, the real-time stats. With that covered, let's go through 18C first. Here's a table called T. I'm gonna put 10,000 rows into it. So nice and simple, and I've gathered stats. So the database knows about the stats in this table. This is your typical example where I've populated the table and then at 10 p.m. each night, the nightly database stat job comes along and gathers some stats. You can see the table hasn't got stale stats. I've only just gathered stats on it, so the stats aren't stale. The database thinks that I've got 10,000 rows, which is good because there are 10,000 rows. And it's got some information about the columns, etc. If I do this query, select max num count star where T ID greater than 9,000. The IDs are scattered simply from one to 10,000, so I get 1,000 rows. The count star is 1,000, that's the rows 9,000 up to 10,000. And the optimizer did a very good job at estimating that. You can see there that the display cursor returns, index range scan, I'm gonna get 1,000 rows, which is exactly what I got. This is to be expected because the stats aren't stale, the stats are up to date, and they exactly represent what the table currently looks at. But of course, I populated the table during the day, say, and now at night I've gathered stats. And of course, what does this table do the next day? It starts receiving more data. So let's simulate that. Let's put in another 1,000 rows. These are the values 10,001 up to 11,000. This is what happens to tables during the day. They get more data. And the problem, of course, is people are gonna run queries on this table, but those queries 
don't take into account the fact that the data has changed. In fact, the optimizer stats still reflect last night. Even if I flash out the monitoring info, the database says the stats aren't stale. I haven't changed enough of the data yet, which is typically going to be the case when a table gets incremental changes you know, throughout its lifetime. The table still thinks, the optimizer still thinks, yes, the optimizer still thinks the table only has 10,000 rows, even though I've added 1,000 to it. The column distribution is unchanged. Now when I run the query, I can see the reality is there are now 2,000 rows for ID greater than 9,000. But as you might expect, the optimizer still thinks there's only 1,000. It has actually said it has unaware of those extra 1,000 rows because the stats haven't changed. And this is that problem that we always are playing catch up with stats. We don't want to gather stats all the time really aggressively because that's a performance overhead. But by the same token, we don't want our stats to be out of date because we get problematic queries. And I would imagine that most people here are in this kind of scenario where we gather stats at night and the table slowly changes throughout the day and gets more and more out of date with the stats or out of whack with the stats. And then each night with the stats, bring it back into sync. So how have we improved this in Oracle 19? Let's now connect to a 19 database and run that exact same demo. Here's my table called T. There's my 10,000 rows and I've gathered table stats. The stats aren't stale as we'd expect. We've just gathered the stats. And as before, the table has 10,000 rows. I've included now a new column in 19 called the notes column. You'll see this on several of the statistics tables and you'll see its importance shortly. The column statistics are the same as we saw in 18C. We have the low high value and the number of distinct values. Let's run our query. We know in advance that there's gonna be 1,000 rows between 9,000 and 10,000. So that's unchanged from the 18C demo. And as you'd expect, the database thinks there's 1,000. So far, so good. Everything's running just fine. Let's now start to mess with it as we did with 18C. I've added those extra 1,000 rows. At this point, the optimizer no longer has that correct information. Let's flush out the monitoring info. Just to stress, the database hasn't detected that the data is stale. This isn't the normal kind of operation where if you change at least, I think, 15% of the table size or 10% of the table size, then the database thinks that is stale. So the stats still think are stale. Nothing is going on behind the scenes here. But now look at user tab statistics. For one table, we have two rows now in the user tab statistics column. We have one with notes as null, which is 10,000 rows. And we have a new entry here called stats on conventional DML that says the table now has 11,000 rows. I haven't done a DBMS stats call. I've simply said, done some DML, just normal DML, and the database has detected that. That already is looking fairly promising. Similarly, even at the column level, we picked up low values, high values, et cetera, some new extrema. Let's now run our query. So 2,000 rows, but what did the optimizer think? Well, the optimizer did a lot better. In 18C, it was stuck up thinking it was still 1,000. In 19C, you can see, no pun intended, that now it estimated 1,959 rows, um, which is very, very close to our 2,000. So it did a lot better job. And you can see from the notes, it said, I've used dynamic statistics. And which ones have I used? The ones that are statistics that have come out of doing conventional DML. So that's the real-time statistics, the stats that now get calculated just by the act of doing DML. It's obviously not every time you DML. We do some sampling and we do some sort of intermittent flushing of those stats to keep the performance acceptable on, in terms of background work. You might be thinking, why do I get 1959 and not 2000? One of the things that's way too expensive to actually calculate just on, a, on real time DML is the number of distinct values. That's obviously incredibly expensive because you have to go visit all the previous data again. So we don't change the number of distinct values. So this table still thinks it only has 10,000 distinct values. Therefore, when we did ID greater than 9,000, we actually shrunk the estimate down slightly from um, 10, 000, from 2000 to 1959. But still, we're much better. So that was 19C real-time stats. That's a really nice little addition that's coming in 19C.
Number four, importing without data. Here's the question. My requirement is to import DDL only, but when I imported the data pump file, I did not get any PL SQL modules. Now that's all the information I had on this question. And um, I wasn't entirely sure what the entire scenario is. So what I did was I simply did some tests and I thought I'd share them with you and show you a couple of the idiosyncrasies with data pump import. Um, but I actually couldn't get to a, seed state, a situation where I didn't get my PL SQL modules imported. But we'll go through some things and get some good learning done anyway. So I'm gonna do all of this in the Scott schema. Um, on database 18, it doesn't really matter what version, data pump's been around since uh, Oracle 10. I've got the standard tables in the Scott schema, emp, dept, department, et cetera, et cetera. But just to make sure there is some PL SQL in there, I'm gonna create a little routine called myproc. And as you can see, it's not the world's most sophisticated procedure, but it'll do for the purpose. You can see I've got bonus step, emp, and sale grade, and my procedure there called my proc. What I'm going to do is now do an export data pump and actually unload the entire Scott schema to a flat file. And that'll be our use for things importing. I've just seen in the chat that Luther said, does each statement execution cause a hard parse? Um, no, it's the same as normal uh, optimizer in the sense that we will effectively um, make a decision as to whether a statement should be uh, reparsed over time. Uh, in the same way that even now, if you gather table stats, that doesn't forcibly reparse every single statement that uses that table. It basically works out over a slow period of time to actually decide to, um, to reparse them to avoid a giant parse storm. Um, that's on the previous topic. So you can see I've unloaded the uh, Scott schema to a uh, dump file. And now we're going to explore some of the means in which we do an import of a data pump. To clear out my schema, I'm going to drop all the tables and drop my procedure. And now the first thing you can see, it's empty. And the first thing I'll do is now import it in. And this is how we import just DDL. You can see there I've got that extra parameter called content equals metadata only. That's our indication to data pump to say, only please import the DDL and not the actual row data itself. That's finished, you'd imagine there's only 20 rows in the Scott schema and just a few tables. And as I said at the start, I couldn't actually replicate the example of actually not getting the source. Using content equals metadata only, you can see I get the four tables and I get the PL SQL source back as well. Um, so unfortunately I couldn't replicate and because I don't have the entire scenario there, that's the best I could do. But even so, it's worth exploring this a little bit further to see where things um, can be interesting when it comes to import data pump. I'll drop everything again so I can do another import data pump. Now, if you're a dinosaur like myself, you're probably used to old export and old import, and there was never a parameter called content equals metadata only in export and import. And so you yeah, definitely have to go fishing around the manuals and find out what is there. But for those that don't know, one of the cool things in um, data pump that came along, I think in 11.2, is what we call legacy mode. And you can see here, now I'm doing an import data pump with rows equals no. That is an invalid parameter for data pump. It's a valid parameter for export. But one of the nice things it actually shows you, we actually have here, it says, ah, you did rows equals false or rows equals no. I know what you meant. You meant it to be met content equals metadata only. Data pump will now try to interpret your old style export commands and actually replace them with the correct data pump commands. That's very cool indeed. And as you can see, it loaded my tables in and it still worked just as before. I got my, t my PL SQL and my rows, no problems there. One thing that's interesting there is, as you can see, there's no rows in the employee table. As we said, we said rows equals no, but you can see hopefully on the screen there as we've got a bit of a drama now because I did import the tables. I didn't import the data, but notice the stats. The stats come along with a data, a data pump import. It says there are actually 14 rows in that table. That's a drama because in reality, there are actually no rows in that table. I might not want those stats to be put in. Let's drop all the rows again. 
Let's now try another legacy parameter, one that came from export import, statistics equals none. And I wanted to show this example because even though data pump legacy mode has some good things like it managed to replace rows equals false with content equals metadata only, when it stores statistics equals none, it said, yes, that's a legacy parameter. I know what that is. And I just ignored it. Well, that's not what it used to do in old import. Statistics equal none used to do no stats. Um, unfortunately, it just ignored it. So when we go look at the table, we can actually see it actually did put the stats back in, even though we said stats equals none. So legacy mode is good in the main, but there's a few little gotchas that you need to be careful of. If I drop it again, if I want to actually use the correct parameter, it's exclude equals statistics. And in that case, I can mix and match the legacy parameters, but exclude equals statistics is the correct data prompt parameter. And now you can see no stats came in. And so that's uh, sort of just to show you a few little bits and pieces about how input data pump has a few little anomalies, a few little idiosyncrasies that you need to be aware of. But in all these cases, I never managed to get to a place where I didn't actually manage to get the PL SQL versions or the PL SQL code re-imported. Um, so unfortunately, I don't think I can help with that one. Okay, that's the cleanup. We don't need to look at that anymore. Let's go back to this. Okay, just looking at Lassie's chat here. When talking about GTD, you showed an example of stats from the session. Lassie, you would get the same behavior in the 12D version. Yes, yeah, so that is a valid point, Lassie, and I probably should have extended the demo. And just to um, explain what and Lassie is saying is, in session one, I put in 10,000 rows, gathered stats. Session two, I put in 50 rows, gathered stats. In reality, I need to go back to session one and prove that it doesn't see the 50 rows as well. Um, it should still see the original 10,000 rows. Um, <laughs> this is one of those times I'll say, you just need to trust me on that one, Lassie. But yes, um, please take the demo and do it. You'll find that it actually does do that. Um, I was just being prudent on time and perhaps a touch lazy. Yes, it does do it, but you know, I just wave my hands like, trust me, it'll be fine. <laughs> Lacey's going, no way. What time's it? 8.49. Yeah, I reckon we can, oh, raw devices. This is a big one. We'll try to get this done and then this will probably be our last for the day. It's a bit sad. So many to do, so many cool things to do. Not to worry. 12C raw devices. I read somewhere that as of 12C, Oracle no longer supports raw devices for database storage. Do we have to move to ASM? And the answer to that is maybe. Let me clarify. If you go to, or first I should say, yes, you are correct. In the documentation, in fact, there's the link there. It actually says, D support of raw storage devices. I want to stress here, we, distinct, we differentiate very carefully between deprecated and de-support. Deprecated means we're not putting any more work into this. We advise you to move away from it. At one day in the future, we will simply stop having it all together. De-supported is a little bit more severe. De-supported is simply saying, if you use this, you are on your own, and there's a very good chance it won't work altogether. For example, um, we de-supported streams um, in a recent version of Oracle. It's simply not there anymore. That's what we mean by de-supported. Obviously, we can't stop you from using raw devices, but they are totally de-supported in Oracle 12. There's a very good chance that one day you'll try to create a data file that points to a raw device and it'll simply say invalid file name, invalid data file, et cetera. You can't use them in 12, even if they're working for you. So I can't stress that enough. And don't get me wrong, ASM is very cool. ASM is a really cool piece of technology. It's been around for Ever. It came out actually in 8.1. So it's nearly ooh, what's that, a decade, 20 years old, 20 years old, nearly ASM. So it's robust, it's time proven, and obviously is uh, the underlying um, disk management technology that sits on top of, AS, um, on top of our exit data machines. So ASM is super cool, but I fully concede that if you're a DBA that has always had a file-based uh, system or even a raw based system and you're used to working at the storage level or system administrator level with managing your files and your storage then ASM might be a little bit of a jump in terms of a learning curve. I'd recommend you go ahead and do it. It's very easy to have ASM uh, just even on a, on a play database but I understand if you're in the middle of getting ready to upgrade and you're going I've never touched ASM 
I'm in a bit of a panic. So that's my but there in that statement, the fact that it is quite possible that ASM you might find a bit daunting, at least to start with. But one of the cool things, if you read that D support argument nice and carefully, you see you can have a supported shared file system. And I thought I'd do a little trip down memory lane for you here. I used to work in a company where we had a mainframe system, and this is back in the ooh, early 90s. Uh, it was a mining company in Perth. And we had mainframes. I was actually a COBOL programmer back in the day. And we decided to move to Oracle. And in those days in Australia, if you were buying an Oracle system, you would buy a little Sun server that I think is an Enterprise 450. They were like the machine of choice. And you ran Oracle on that. And generally people were very successful with that. And so you'd go buy another one and then you'd go buy another one. And very soon you've got lots of these really cool little sun boxes all running Oracle databases. And then, oh, this is a sad, sad moment. Something terrible happened. What is the terrible thing that happened? No, a shark didn't come along. Something worse. A SAN came along, a storage area network. And like back in the day, you know, they're good now, but back in the day, that was just a nightmare. And so the motivation for them was fairly simple. Local disk causes problems, according to the people that had to look after disk on your systems. You know, they were hard to manage because they were scattered across lots and lots of servers and they were inefficient. And, you know, there was perhaps some argument, some, some truth in that. Because if you think about it, lots of different servers, each having their own disk, meant that, as each one got to 50% or 70% full, you simply couldn't use free space from another server because it was in a different physical cabinet. That was a bit of a problem. And hence the claim solution to all of this was to consolidate and law put all that information out of the servers themselves onto a storage area network. And when these things came along, they were revered as you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread. You got to consolidate all your storage. You got, supposedly much better performance and much, much ease of management. And funnily enough, the storage administrator suddenly became the single most powerful person in the organization generally, because you had to go to them cap in hand to actually get um, some storage allocation for your database. And a lot of people actually failed huge with storage area networks because the early storage area networks were crammed full of disks and had a little tiny CPU in the control that managed them. And so you could never get the performance out of them that you would get in local disks. And there's sort of an irony nowadays in the fact that you look at uh, the big data revolution, and that's all about not consolidating storage. It's more about moving storage back to where the code is or moving code to the storage. And so you see nowadays with big data, a lot of systems have local disks. You just have lots and lots of little systems. But I digress. The biggest issue with storage area networks, of course, was the network part. We had these little thin networks between the disk and the servers, which absolutely hobbled performance. But the reality is times have changed. InfiniBand came along, which gave you incredibly low latency. You look at things like Fiber Channel now, you can now do 128 gigabit Fiber Channel. So storage area networks, I used to be scathingly critical of them, but they actually have improved um, dramatically over time. The only drama is, as they've got better, they've got insanely expensive as well. In fact, that's one of the reasons that you look at something like the uh, Exadata boxes, we still put that disk inside the cabinet. Uh, we don't reach out to storage area networks. So what's a cheaper, simpler solution? That's a little bit of the, of the, sort of the, the backdrop of memory, and that is Ethernet, NFS. You know, a classic example is in my home here, I have a server just behind this monitor, and it's simply got a whole stack of disks plugged into it and it serves as my local file server for the myriad of laptops I have in this household, uh, much to the chagrin of my partner. It's one of those things that we often do, the ability to actually have cheap storage available over a very cheap network. It is, you know, and that's cool for database. If you could run an ethernet simple NFS uh, network for your database, that's super cool because A, it's dirt cheap. You simply buy the storage, plug in an ethernet cable and you're good to go. It's a shared file system. It satisfies that need in terms of if you can't use raw devices, you can use a shared file system. And that's really good because if you're a DBA and you've never used ASM, there's that nice familiarity. I can log on to any node, for example, in a rack cluster and 
I can see file systems just like they used to look on a single instance machine. We're using rack, things like when you get to transportable table spaces, using parallelism, the ability for all nodes to simply and trivially access files as if they were local to the machine is really cool and avoids any ASM complexities if you're unfamiliar with it and avoids obviously raw devices which are now out the door. So why isn't everyone using NFS, Ethernet, simple you know, uh, NAS-based storage for their Oracle databases? Well, everyone says it's slow, you know, and that is actually partially true. Because if you're using NFS for an Oracle database, just out of the box, NFS was never designed really for databases. It was designed for file sharing, network file sharing, NFS. So Oracle needs to talk to the OS. OS then maintains what's called an NFS cache, like a file cache on your Windows PC. And that eventually makes its way down to the database. Lots of layers, lots of overheads. Wouldn't it be cool if Oracle could talk to a NAS system without all those overheads? And it actually does exist. It's a thing called Direct NFS. It's actually been around since Oracle 11G. And I've actually worked with several customers implementing Direct NFS. And it rocks. Here's a graph from a NetApp, um, which is actually a benchmark done at 200,000 IOPS. That's a lot of IOPS. That is really smoking. And with traditional storage, normal disks, you'd be looking at eight milliseconds. That's the figure on the right. As you work your way down, you can see using direct NFS, which bypasses a lot of that operating system overhead, you can get, what's that? That's half a millisecond. So we're down into microsecond territory at 2,000, 200,000 IOPS. That is insane. Direct NFS really rocks. And because the storage is now being controlled or storage access is now being controlled from directly inside the Oracle kernel, you get some nice little things like the ability to do sparse cloning of databases. You can check that Metalink note, or sorry, that Moz note uh, there to see details about CloneDB. That's a great facility for taking copies or sparse copies of production databases. So my recommendation would be, if you're familiar with ASM, then it's the obvious move to, moving to point if you're on RAW at the moment. You'd go to ASM because you're familiar with it. If you're not familiar with ASM, have a good long look at direct NFS, even if you're not really familiar with it. If you've got the appropriate NAS technology that actually backs it up, you might find direct NFS is a really easy to use and wonderful piece of technology that I think is vastly underused um, in the Oracle landscape. It is nine o'clock. Whoa, let's go back one. We're done. We're not actually done. We had a whole lot of slides that we've just skipped over, but not to worry, we're out of time. Thank you very much for your time. I will note that there will not be a DBA office hours next month because I'll be in the middle of K-scope season. So I'll be at K-scope and probably on a plane at the time office hours is meant to be on. But as I always say, thank you very much for your attendance. There'll be a YouTube video of this going up in the very near future. As always, thank you for giving up your time. I find this easy to do because obviously it's my content. For you guys, it's obviously much, much more of a mental drain to actually listen to me rabbit on. So thank you for your time and we'll see you all again next month. Bye for now.